<coughs> All right, Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. Of course, this is right after the crucifixion of our Lord. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Many times in the Bible, when the presence of the Lord shows up, there's an earthquake. Amen. That happens in uh, the giving of the law. That happens in some of the stuff in the Revelation. Uh, happens here. Let me tell you something. There's a, there is a earthquake coming that doesn't just shake earth. It shakes the stars up in heaven. Amen. You know, that was something. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. When God decides to show up in power, you can't help but notice him. <laughs> you, you could have asked these keepers, uh, did you notice anything unusual today? They said, "Yeah, we sure did." Did you see? A, did you see anybody? Uh, yes, we sure did. I mean, they shook, they trembled, they became as dead men. I guess that means they passed out with fear. Amen. Verse five, and the angel answered and said unto the women, "Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified." When God's power show up and God's people show up and especially God's angels show up. One of the first things you have to say to everybody is, fear not. <laughs> you know what's missing? Fear of God. Oh, boy. We don't have it as we once did. Amen. When God's presence shows up, you will fear. If people aren't fearing God, you know what that tells me? He's not around. He is not showing up in his power. He has said, all right, Buster Brown, you want me to go that way? I'll let you. Because when God shows up, there is trembling. I am afraid in the United States of America and even here in the so-called Bible Belt, he's let us go. Because if he was here in power, there would be a lot more fear of him oh, yes. than there is today. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Even the powerful resurrection and all the power that it has, and God knows it has some power, is still under the authority of God's word. He, that angel does not say he is risen. He says he is risen as he said. There is only way Jesus could have risen. As he said. What does the passage over there in 1 Corinthians 15 on the gospel say? Died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day. According to the scriptures. The word of God is what's over everything. You know, we make a big deal about the King James Bible here. Don't let anybody correct it. Because it's got the power even over the resurrection. There can't be any resurrection without it going by the rules. Amen. Of God's word. You want to get rid of your rules? Yeah, you're not going to get along well with the Bible. God even put rules on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It had to be according to the scriptures. It had to be as he said. God puts rules on everything. You hate rules? You're going to hate God. <laughs> Have you ever read his law? Have you ever read his New Testament epistles? Rule after rule after rule after rule. But if you love God, guess what? You're tickled to death to do something to please him. That's the difference. That's what makes the difference between somebody who loves doing it and somebody who thinks it's a bunch of rules to go by. You love God and you know that pleases him, you're tickled to death. Mm -hmm. You don't care much for him, it's just a bunch of stupid rules. Let me read that again. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. 
The Lord doesn't have anything to hide. He doesn't have to worry that, oh no, if I let them see the place, they'll see that it was just an illusion. They'll see that it was just sleight of hand. They'll see that it was just a trick. God says, uh, when I bring somebody from the dead, they're up. You come and look. Amen. And you see if it looks like he's still there or not. Feel free. You know what he says in another place? He says, prove me and see if I will not pour you out a blessing. You can't even. God invites you to test him. That's correct. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, when I'm pretty sure of stuff, a lot of times I hold back on actually telling people because I don't want to get caught in being incorrect. Somebody think I'm lying. When a message is coming from God, you don't even have to apologize. You don't have to worry. When he says it, that's what's going to happen. Sometimes we would thought, well, it might not happen just like that, and then I'll look like a liar, and then I'll be misunderstood, and then somebody will think I don't know what I'm talking about. God doesn't have any of those concerns. What he says happens 100% to the penny every single time. Never been wrong Amen. yet. Won't ever be wrong. Amen. So he has no problem prophesying. Now, other prophets, oh boy, they have to, they have to couch it. Have you ever read the prophecies of Nostradamus? Oh, yeah. They're not real clear. <laughs> you can interpret them to mean this or that, and that way, whatever happens, you can kind of uh, interpret his vague wording to sort of kind of mean something. Sometimes some of the clairvoyants and uh, prophets, so to speak, have said, this year, my spirit guide is telling me that there will be significant events in the White House. Hey, man, the White House is where the president lives. Anything he does is pretty significant. <laughs> That's not much of a prophecy. God's prophecies are way better than that. Oh, yeah. Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Uh, let me tell you about your Christian life. You hear from God. It will have fear and great joy. <laughs> that is a seemingly contradictory thing. But when you get in the presence of God, there's some fear, but there's also some joy. Yeah. Now, when you get to heaven, and you're in your glorified body, and you're not sinning anymore, perfect love casteth out fear, does it not? Yeah. But down here, do you have perfect love? <laughs> I bet you don't. <laughs> I bet you're still imperfect. I bet you still love the Lord, but some things in this world. I bet you still love the Lord, but love this flesh. I bet you've got some impure, imperfect love, so fear and imperfect love still coexist pretty well. Thank God we'll reach a day where it won't. But down here on earth, while you're still sinning, but still love the Lord, you're going to have two natures battling in you, and you're going to go to do what you do for God with fear and great joy. And they do. Verse 9, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. I mean, you just have to keep saying it. You're seeing angels and Jesus himself and dead people rose from the dead. Somebody's going to have to keep reassuring you that you don't have to be scared. Does that not make sense? Amen. I guarantee you, one of these days, when the dead start coming up, people are going to be shook up. Mm -hmm. Now let's skip down to verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Oh, there's those rules again. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Oh, praise the Lord, there's the relationship. Even unto the end of the world. You know what Jesus said? He said, all right, I'm going back there. I'm not literally and physically on earth anymore. But let me tell you one thing, you can rest a 
assured of, I am with you. You know why you can go and be a witness for the Lord and keep living for Him and overcome some things and keep growing in Him and your life get better and better the longer you live for Him? Because Jesus is with you. That's the secret. If Jesus is with you, all is won. If He is not with you, all is lost. So let's look back now at the, at the message that is brought from these angels. And we'll uh, expound it a little bit and see several messages from it. I want to title my message, The Sevenfold Message of the Angel at the Resurrection. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll come down and speak to us. Lord, I pray that we'll see some things that will thrill us and excite us and instruct us and warn us and help us to live better lives for you, dear God, in these last days before you come as we constantly remember your resurrection. What a, what a theme it was, dear God, in the book of Acts when the apostles were so stirred up in such power and come down with the Holy Spirit. They talked so much about the resurrection. And I pray we'd remember it. And I pray we'd remember it well and remember it often and speak of it often. Dear God, and be a better witness for you as we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to say today that even in this greatest trial, the death of Jesus Christ is a great trial for his followers. It was a horrible thing. It was an unimaginable thing. But even in this great trial, God had a great, complete message for his people. And he sent an angel down to do it. Now, he didn't have to send angels to do it much now. now there's some angels coming back with some messages in the tribulation period. But in the church age, it's mainly mine and your job to give that message, isn't it? Isn't that what he said in the last verses that we read? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them and so forth. It's our job. Now the occasion of our Lord's resurrection from the dead prompted God to send a message to Christ's followers. And he did it pretty soon. He did it pretty soon after the death, didn't he? This is uh, just a few days after the Lord Jesus Christ had died. Now, one of the problems that you'll have in your relationship with the Lord is his timing is not your timing, is it? How many of you have been saved a while and you've noticed you wanted something quicker than God gave it to you? Or you wanted to enjoy something longer than God let you enjoy it? His timing is just not always our timing. Amen. And here's what he did. Within just a few days, he got a message to him. Thank God for his care in sending a message. Now, don't be one of these people with all this nervous energy. You better have an answer from God right now. Sometimes He lets you sit there and learn some lessons for a little while going through a trial. Even when the Lord came back, you know what He said? He said, Tarry here a little while, and then the apostles can go back. So uh, He let them sit there a while, but pretty quickly, pretty quickly, he got a message to him. So let's look at this message. Proverbs chapter, I'm sorry, not Proverbs. Matthew 28, verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. Fear not. Let me tell you something. The first message that God gives you is, Fear not. You know why you fear, can fear not? Because you can trust him to take care of them. Sometimes it does end up being in a worst case scenario. And in those rare occasions, God gives special grace for you to get through it, but most of the time, it does not end up in the worst case scenario. Most of the time, in our own fear and doubt and anxiety, we're making it worse. Yes, Amen. And it's only in the rarest occasions that we actually get burned at the stake. It's only in the rarest of occasions that we actually get beat up and thrown in jail. It does happen, but it's rare. Those are the exceptions in the punishment of, of our sin and or the persecution for us doing what God told us to do. But this is different than the wicked. The Bible says there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's not the right way to not fear God. There needs to be some fear of God to keep you out of trouble. But once you've trusted him and you're loving him and you're looking for him and you're going to him, that's a real good place for God to say, fear not. Amen. Now, what's the context here? Obviously, this is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the first thing you need to not fear is death in the afterlife. Isn't that a silly thing I just said? The first thing you need to not fear is death. Is that not the most basic fear we all have? How many of you want to get killed today? 
How many of you, if you find out you are going to get killed today, will feel some fear? <laughs> and yet, we don't have to fear death and the afterlife. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the passage that I've quoted a couple times already this morning, talking about the gospel, the great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, let's see, verse 54. So when this corruptible, that's these bodies we live in now, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, that's those bodies we put on that will never corrupt. Those bodies won't have to be bathed like these bodies. Those bodies won't die and rot like these bodies. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to fear death in the afterlife. Amen. There's something else you don't have to fear that's closely related, and that's this. You don't have to fear them which kill the body. Now, if you're not fearing death, then you don't have to fear people. Because the worst thing a person can do to you is kill you. What, what, what worse can they do to you? <laughs> they say, well, they might kill me and then cut up my body. Well, you won't feel them at that point. <laughs> They're not hurting you at all at that point. You're going to resort in glory to God. Even if God forbid you was lost and they killed you, you in hell you ain't feeling anything they're doing to your body. Then you got you got other problems on your mind. Then you do not have to fear them that kill the body. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Uh, you know why the Lord Jesus Christ had such boldness and courage? He knew he didn't have to fear death. Now his death is a little different though. In his death, not only did he take all the physical suffering, which was Horrendous. We can't even imagine. But he had the spiritual suffering of somebody who was holy and without spot taking on the sins of the whole world. You can't imagine the opposite that that is for Jesus Christ to be totally without sin and taking on everybody's sins. Oh, his death was different. No wonder he feared. But as far as just death, he wouldn't have had to fear it, and you and I certainly don't have to. Thank God we're not taking on everybody else's sins. Fear not death in the afterlife. Fear not them which kill the body. You know what this is? This is comfort. You know what you're going to need in life? You're going to need some comfort as you go through life. There are going to be some things that are going to break your heart. There are going to be some things that are going to disappoint you. I wish I could give you better than you. I wish I could tell you your life is just going to be great. And one good thing after another would happen to you. But now let's mix in with some blessings. There's going to be some heartache. You know what we got? If we have the message of the Lord, we have comfort. Fear not. Amen. All right, number two. What's the next thing he says here in verse five? He says, uh, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. I know. Let me tell you something, folks. If any man love God, the same is known of him. By their fruits ye shall know them. And even if we humans can know some things about you, obviously God Almighty knows some things about you. And he sent an angel down and he said, Fear not, I know. Proverbs 20 verse 11, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. If you've had multiple children, you know that there are some things you can trust one child with and they'll take care of it. But if you give it to the other one, it'll be a mess. <laughs> That's just the truth of it. And everybody has their strengths and everybody has their weaknesses and the people that live with them all day every day knows it. And much more than that, God knows it. James 1.22, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He looks in the mirror, sees the problem, and gets so busy he never fixes it. Never washes his face or whatever was needed. 
But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I know. You know how they know? By the testimony of your life. Don't tell me that when you woke up that morning you went and looked in the mirror if you didn't wash the dirt off your face that you saw there. Everybody that sees you later that day at work, they won't know whether you looked in the mirror or not. They won't care whether you looked in the mirror or not, but they'll notice that you didn't wash the dirt off your face. They'll notice that you didn't brush the food out from between your teeth. They'll notice. I know. You know how you know? By their testimony of life. But more importantly than that, I know because God knows your heart. Amen. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. On to say. Amen. The Lord Jesus was going to Jericho, as you know, and there were crowds thronging him, and poor little short Zacchaeus couldn't even get anywhere near him and he went and climbed up in a tree and the Lord with people all over him stopped and he looked up and addressed that he was. Isn't that something? Yes. How, why did he do that? I'll tell you why because the Lord knew his heart. How about the woman with the issue of blood? Jesus was oh, tackling yeah. again. Crowds everywhere. People jostling and undoubtedly bumping up against him as he tried to walk through. And one woman had faith to touch the hem of his garment. And Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? And his disciples got a little aggravated at him. This is what I read in the passage. Right. He said, you see the multitude thronging you and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody touched me. There is virtue gone out of me. And he wouldn't go on well, he found out, you know what? He saw something in that lady's heart. Sometimes with a man like Zacchaeus that's kind of a mover and shaker and has some money and has some authority and God knows their heart. Sometimes with a woman like that lady that, that has kept herself out of the public eye because she's got that issue of blood that's kind of shameful and it's not something that she wants to bring much attention to. God knows their heart too. I don't care if you're rich, powerful, famous, and influential, or you're somebody far, far backstage, so to speak, and almost nobody knows you. God knows you. Fear not, I know. And you know what he knew about him? This is really the only thing he needs to know about you, although he knows everything. But the main thing he needs to know is, I know ye seek Jesus. Is there somebody here today that's seeking Jesus? God knows it. Don't get me wrong, as I already said, he knows everything about you, but the main thing he's looking for is, are you seeking Jesus Christ as son? I've got seven children. You know how I love them. And if somebody loves one of my children, I love them. Amen. Even if my children don't exactly deserve it. I mean, they're not perfect. But if they love one of my children, I love them. There is an automatic kinship there. And we love the same people. And here's God the Father, holy and spotless and sinless. And here's God the Son, holy and spotless and sinless. And the great amount of love you and I can't even imagine the way Jesus died on that cross for us. If somebody loves his Son, he's looking to help them. Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. That's who God is looking to help. If you're seeking Jesus, you can stop fearing because God the Father is there to help you. God the Holy Spirit is there to help you. Jesus has paid the price for you and is standing there with his arms open saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That is when your fear starts. It stops is when you start seeking Jesus. When the prodigal son made the decision to go home to the father, he made the best decision in his life. Yes. And while he was yet a great way off, the father's home. Fear not, I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. All right, verse 6. He is not here. 
Now, I hate that he's not here in a way. It would be neat to see him literally and physically. It would be a lot of fun to see him do the miracles that he did. It would be captivating to hear him teach and preach the word of God Amen. as those disciples did. There are some real advantages that would be uh, that would come along with Jesus being right here with us literally and physically. And thank God one of these days we'll get that. But in the meantime, Jesus told his Disciples, it is expedient for you that I go away. That's right. And if I go away, I'll send you the comforter. Now, what is the first thing we think when we think about Jesus not being here? What did he say in John 14, 2? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So if he's gone, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's preparing a place for me. How would you like a mansion? Provided by Jesus. Do uh, you know of a better building than him? I mean, I know people that shop a long time because they want just the right builder to do their house just right. You know? <laughs> hey, let me tell you about all those saved people. We got a builder, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing a place for us. If he has gone away, he is preparing a place for us. And the second thing I've already referred to a little bit. John chapter 16, matter of fact, I'll just read it to be sure I get it right here. He said, if I go, I'm sending the comforter. John 16, verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Notice it says reprove the world. It doesn't say rail on the world. It doesn't say revile the world. But it does say reprove the world. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. Uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus said, now there's some stuff I really want to tell you right now, but you couldn't take it. So when I get out of here, the Holy Spirit will come, and he'll reveal all things to you. How, how good is your fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Are you the spirit in fellowship, is he filling you? Is he controlling you? That's where your instruction comes from. You ever feel like you've made mistake after mistake and you can't straighten it out? And you're scared to death. And I've made mistakes in my life where I was scared to move. Because the last two or three I had made were all wrong. <laughs> and I thought they were right. So I was afraid if I do the next two or three things I think is right, they'll be all messed up. You know what the problem was? I wasn't spirit filled. I mean, I was saved, thank God. I was generally in the fellowship of the Lord. I wasn't doing, you know, the terrible, uh, scandalous things. But I wasn't filled with the Spirit of God. He wasn't guiding me into all truth. I messed up. But if he is not here, that means he's preparing a place for us. And that means the Comforter is here. So if fear not is comfort... And if I know is discerning and insightful, and God's people certainly can be, especially his messengers, he is not here is informational. It tells us, hey, let me tell you what this means. This means Jesus is taking care of your future and your eternity. And the comforter is here to take care of your nasty, you know, the, if Jesus is taking care of the sweet by and by, the comforter is coming to help you in the nasty now and now. Amen. That's a good point. Right. He is not here. All right, what does verse 6 go on to say? He is not here, for he is risen. Wait a minute. He died, right? What do you mean he is risen? Anybody know any other dead people that are risen? I mean, that you knew personally. I know there are some from the Old Testament and stuff. No. This is unbelievable. He is risen, therefore, he conquered the flesh. When this flesh dies, we can't get it back up. Some people sleep the hardest. That's about all you can do is give up from sleep. Amen. You sure ain't going to give up from death, are you? Therefore, he conquered the flesh. He conquered the world. 
If it wasn't bad enough that we have the sin nature in our own bodies and we're going to die on our own, this world will kill you, won't it? You eat just like this world tells you to eat, yep, it'll kill you. <laughs> you live just like this world tells you to live, it'll kill you. You follow this world's philosophies, dead, man. <laughs> Graveyard dead, as uh, that old comedian Jerry Flower used to say. <laughs> I mean, down you go. You know what Jesus did? He came up in spite of the flesh. He came up in spite of his humanity. He came up in spite of this world. He conquered the flesh, the world. He conquered the devil. Amen. Don't you know the devil would have loved to have kept him dead? Oh, yeah. If there was any way in this world the devil could have kept Jesus dead, he would have. Let me tell you what, he couldn't. Amen. He overcame the flesh. He overcame the world. He overcame the devil. Obviously, he overcame death. And by getting up out of this grave, he overcame the grave. And yet it goes further than that. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He didn't just go six feet under, as we say, you know, when we bury somebody. He went all the way down into the lower parts of the earth. Went in. He overcame hell when he did this. I was doing a family emotions with the kids, and somebody said, well, what was he doing in those three days? <laughs> and I told them some of these things. Those three days, he was doing some things. I remember when other Ken Perky died. There lay his body. Somebody touched it and kind of pushed on it. I wonder what he did. They knew it just became obvious to them that he wasn't there anymore. It was his body we were used to seeing. But he wasn't there. I remember he and I talked about spiritual things and eternal things. And we would speculate about how this works or that works, you know, when you get up there into heaven and glory and get over in the spirit world. And I remember one of the things I thought soon after he died was, man. He knows all those things he and I talked about all those times. He knows them better than I do and before I do. <laughs> I was just a little jealous of him. <laughs> Let me tell you, our Lord Jesus, he was busy those three days. Amen. He had a lot going on. He overcame the flesh, the world, the devil, death, the grave, and the hell. <laughs> as he said, he is risen. As he said, therefore God's word rules over even resurrection. Out. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The Lord Jesus had told the disciples these things. They should have known it. They should have understood it. But a lot of times when somebody says something that just seems too fantastic to be true, we figure it must mean something else. You might say it goes over our head. And even though he had said it clearly multiple times, I'm, I'm afraid they didn't get it. He is risen. That's thrilling. God has power over death. That makes all the difference to you. When we bury our loved ones, and God knows we're going to have to, we're either going to get buried by our loved ones or we're going to have to bury our loved ones. We have a great hope other people don't have. You know what that hope is? Because Jesus rose, we're going to die. We're trusting him as our Savior. He is risen. All right, then he says this. He says, see the place. You know how it feels when you go to the place where a loved one lays. Um, but in their case, they're going to see the place where their loved one recently lay, but isn't laying there anymore. What mixed emotions that must bring. On the one hand, this is the place where when I came and realized they were gone, oh, how it hurt my heart. And you remember that and you feel that. Sometimes
sometimes years later I go to a place where I felt a strong emotion and it comes back to me. Sometimes I hear a song that I used to hear when I felt a strong emotion and it comes back to me. Sometimes something carries me back. So they go and see this place where he lay and yet he isn't there anymore. So on the one hand they feel the sorrow and on the other hand they feel the wonder and the astonishment and the thrill that he is up now. What mixed emotions. How amazing, how confusing, how can God the Son become a man? How can he die? And how can he rise again? There are all kinds of things you ought to feel. Amen. When somebody runs through the doctrines of the Word of God and you don't feel anything, something is wrong somewhere. Oh, yes. Paul talks about there comes a time when they're past feeling. Head knowledge is one thing, but when it's head knowledge of thrilling things like this, you ought to feel something. When's the last time you've been to church and some of these great truths were being brought out and you felt something? Oh, yeah. There are plenty of Bible believing Baptists that have heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. And, heard it. and they don't feel anything anymore. Why? Among other things, the, the comforter isn't there with you. Among other things, you love this world too much. Yeah. There's some things going on, there's some things wrong. But he says, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, both the great former occupant. And the great event that happened there. I like to go and visit historical sites. I think that is the newest, coolest thing. And I make no apology for saying my favorite period of history anywhere in the world, anywhere in history, is early American history. I like the Baptists and their influence. I like the founding of this nation and the freedoms that we enjoy. I, I, like, I like several things in history. I like many times in history. But if I had to pick only one, that's it. And, of course, you know our boys live up there in Virginia. And when I go up there, I always go see some of those historical places. And I think about the great men that lived in that house. We went and saw George Washington's house. And we went and saw his tomb. I thought about the great man and what influence he had. No way in the world to estimate the influence from a, from a human perspective of George Washington. And that's a good night for the man. And what about the great events that happened in that area? So when they went to see the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, here is where Jesus lay, and here is where an unbelievable thing happened. He came up from the dead, angels showed up, and a couple of days before that, other people started coming up out of the graves and went into the city and were seen of a lot of people. You couldn't deny it. There is wild stuff going on as a result of this. See the place. That's the historical significance of it, but let's talk about the personal influence of it. These are people that knew the Lord Jesus. These are people that loved him. This was not only a place of great historical importance, this was a place that held the body of their best friend. I mean, they're feeling monumental historical importance and they're feeling heart-piercing personal feelings. Do you have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus? Do you realize how great and wonderful he is, but do you also hold him that deep and dear to your heart? You ought to be feeling some of both as we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You ought to be thinking what a great history changing uh, event that was, and you ought to be thinking about what it meant to you personally. See the place. That's the instructional or demonstrative in, in message from this angel. Now let's look at the next part. It's the motivational part of this message. Chapter uh, Matthew 28, verse 7, he says, And go quickly and tell. When you see something like this, your job is to tell some people. Hey, Christian, when's the last time you told somebody about the Lord? When's the last time you told somebody how you got saved? When's the last time you told somebody how important the Lord Jesus is to you? He said, go quickly and tell. Telling the lost is our privilege, 
but it is also our responsibility. Paul said, I am debtor, debtor. I owe a debt. And when you owe a debt, it's your responsibility to pay that debt, isn't it? I wonder how come the U.S. government doesn't pay their debt. <laughs> I don't think they believe in responsibility. Amen. <laughs> Somebody said it's, I don't know, I haven't looked at that bag recently, it's too depressing. But is it well over 30 trillion at this point? Yeah. <laughs> 30 tri what is 30 trillion? Does it, can anybody even conceive of that number? What is 30 trillion? How would you like to have to count out 30 trillion dollars? I mean, even in hundreds. Somebody said to, to get a, an idea of how much a trillion is, if you had $100 bills, not one dollar bills, hundred dollar bills. And you started stacking them. You know, hundred dollar bills are pretty thin. And you started stacking hundred dollar bills as high as they go. If you stacked a trillion hundred dollar bills, it'd go plumb up to the moon and halfway back. I believe it. And our national debt is thirty of those. Oh, I mean, well over thirty as I understand it. Uh, yeah, um, if you owe a debt, you have a responsibility. Never mind the government. Nobody else can get by with that. And, and let me say this, they're not going to get by with it much longer. Their time is about up. You know that, don't you? Are you ready for that? Christian, uh, is your future settled whether or not we have the present government that we have? Let's be sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need an anchor. But let me get back to the text. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Go quickly and tell, because telling is our responsibility, yeah. but also our privilege. It's a blessing. It's a joy to say something for the Lord here. Go quickly and tell. So we should talk about his resurrection with other disciples. Why? For way of remembrance. When all you've done is hear about Jesus in Sunday school back when you were a little kid, and you're you know, getting older now, you can forget. There's been many a Christian that has dealt the Bible on the shelf quit living for the Lord and quit having reminders and quit going to church and quit spending time with Him in prayer and meditation. And you know what they do? They forget. And this goes back to ancient times. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Peter says, I need to stir up your mind by way of remembrance. You say, Brother Bob, you got some things you say over and over again. You know why? Because I need remembrance, and I assume you do too. And I get that from the Word of God. Go quickly and tell. And then I want to say one other thing about this message, y'all. Close. He says in verse 7, Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him. And I want to say to you that are remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ today, you shall see him. Amen. He is coming back. He said, if I go, I will come again. I hope that affects your decision making day by day that one of these days you're going to see Jesus. Bob Jones Sr., who was a great preacher, how excellent was he in making word pictures and really driving things home. Those old-fashioned preachers did a way better job than us electronic screen preachers, I'll guarantee you. But he said, there are two holy eyes watching me and seeing everything I do. And one of these days, I've got to look into those eyes. Amen. We ought to remember that. Oh, yeah. Christian, ye shall see him. Now, in their case, they were going to see him in the next few minutes. I mean, he was headed before him into Galilee, and as they headed that way, they came right up to him. Let me say this. You don't know how soon you'll see Jesus. 
You say, oh, don't worry. I'm young. I got plenty of time. You may not. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Amen. <coughs> but you'll see him, and you'll see him immediately at death. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The moment you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Amen. You see him immediately then. But you not only see him immediately at death, I hope, that we won't die. I hope the Lord raptures us out of here. As I look and see the, the, the mess that we're getting into, in this world overall, and more specifically in this country, since it's where I live, mm -hmm. oftentimes I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes. <laughs> oftentimes I say that. And even if we don't die, thank God, we'll see him. And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. I don't know how many times I heard Dr. Rutman say, teaching and preaching, and even in, even in personal talk, he would say, come a little quicker, Lord Jesus. He said, he'd say, if I had a button I could push and it would make the rapture happen, you better put your seatbelt on. I'm pushing it first chance by you. He knew that every problem he has or any of us have is fixed at the rapture of the church, at the resurrection day. We will see him. We'll see him immediately at death, and we'll see him at the rapture. All right, this message carried by the angel is a good reminder for Christians of great spiritual truths mm -hmm. verified by the Lord's resurrection. Fear not, I know. He is not here. He is risen. See the place. Go quickly and tell. Ye shall see him. Isn't there a lot of truth packed yes, in this yes. message? Let me tell you about the Lord. He can pack a lot of truth in a short message. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance to read and study your word. And I pray you'll take the truth found here in God. And I pray